live to all my viewers. <laughs> Which will be two less because you guys might be my only two viewers. <laughs> <laughs> you need to tag this with podcast with Utah Business CEO of the Year. And star of American Forks, unfortunately canceled Secret Garden. <laughs> it, it could also be uh, high school, Utah Theater Association high school district champion actor. True. I did win Best Actor in the Region. Nice. For a uh, for one act. That's way awesome. What was the act? It's called <laughs> Zoo Story. Super weird. Why don't you do it for us? That'd be a great podcast. <laughs> yeah, how long is it? We could just do that the whole time. <laughs> do you have uh, all the other parts memorized? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why did they... Oh wait, so that must have been long enough ago that it wasn't during quarantine. Because I was going to say, why didn't they cancel that? But I'm sure they would have. the last thing we did. The next day was our last day of school. It happened really fast, didn't it? Like, yeah. we had no notion that that was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, Rudy Gobert. Well, that day, the 12th of March, we met with our management team and said, we're going to stay open. Mm -hmm. I even said to the management team at 5.30 as we went home, you know, I think we can stay open. I think we can ride, ride this out. And then Rudy Gobert tested that night. The NBA canceled that night. I mean, it's really... Yeah. I remember calling the management team and going, okay, I was just kidding. I guess we're going to close. Yeah. Well, it's hard to not close after the NBA closes because it's just like such a huge organization. You feel weird being like, oh, well, we'll stay open, but you know. Well, and then the next day, there was an earthquake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just that was because. crazy. That was crazy. So I joked about wanting to talk about Michael Jordan. The, th the thing that I want to talk about Michael Jordan with regard to other things as well is his relentless pursuit of excellence. Did you watch the documentary? No, but oh. I, I, and I'll, I'll binge watch it when all 10 episodes are out. Smart, smart. But, uh, but I watched another documentary called um, The Pursuit of Greatness. Mm -hmm. And it had Gretzky, Pele, and Jerry Rice. Oof, what a lineup. And they mentioned Michael Jordan, but obviously he didn't want to participate because he was probably doing this, which is just about him. Oh, right, right. But uh, all of them, wow. Just all the kinds of things that they just, like, nobody forced them. They just did stuff. Like Gretzky was talking about how from the time he was like five, mm -hmm. he would just take a piece of paper and he would watch a hockey game on television with his father. And he would just draw on the piece of paper wherever the puck went. And it gave him a vision of how the plays evolve from mm -hmm. the time he was just because it looked fun. Interesting. He'd draw a rink and he'd just, you know, watch the game and let his let his pen go wherever the puck went. And then he'd save he had just had like whole seasons of puck movement. Mm -hmm. It's not wild. That is wild. That's cool. I wonder what it is. I've thought about this a lot. Like within people like that, Michael Jordan, Pele, Wayne Gretzky, Kobe. Um that makes them feel like they need to fill that void constantly. And I would guess that it's not always a positive thing. In fact, probably a lot of times not. And like they weren't loved as a kid or they well, were bullied or something. And Michael Jordan is kind of a jerk because he's so like, if you're not as passionate as he is, he'll just eat you up. Right. Which I mean, makes you wonder like, do you have to be like that? You know, to, to that's really the good. Oh, that's interesting. I that's the question. I believe you don't because that's just. I feel like the world is a better place if I believe that, but I don't know if it's true. It seems like maybe you can be um, kind and considerate and great, but maybe not. I don't know. So let's start with what are we talking about when we're talking about great? Because Michael Jordan was great, and there are other like athletes and performers who are amazing and great. Like apparently Daniel Day Lewis as an actor is just impossible to get along with because he's just right. so driven. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like so passionate about it. It's like stomping people, you know, like Steve Jobs. But also like just under that are plenty of nice people. Right. So that's why I'm saying I'm talking about greatness. We're talking about like greatest of all time greatness or greatness that we can aspire to and still be nice greatness. Like Hugh Jackman. He's a great actor, but 
still very kind. Well, yeah. And I think an underappreciated factor in this is how fame also makes you a jerk. Like Robert said to me the other night, he has a friend who met Mick Jagger. And that friend said, Mick Jagger is about as nice as you could be if you're that famous. Hmm. So think about Michael Jordan, Mick Jagger, people are constantly asking things from you. You don't really know who your true friends are, you know, like you have an entourage of people that may use you. And I wonder if, like, the more famous you get, if you need to put up a shield of jerk, because otherwise it's just too much. Everyone's always constantly, if you're a pushover and you're Justin Bieber, you're signing autographs for 15 hours a day, you know, like, I don't know. Maybe that's not it, but it seems like that could be part of it. Did I ever tell you the Grandpa Bennett, Robert Redford story? Mm -mm. So Robert Redford created the Sundance Resort and the Tree Room Restaurant. And then like, it wasn't succeeding. It was failing. Mm -hmm. All the staff quit anyway. It was kind of a disaster. Yeah. And, And Grandpa Bennett decided he would take all of his grandchildren who were in Utah at the time to the tree room for lunch on like a Saturday. Mm-hmm. So they go up and Peggy was there and there were some others who were there. And it was just them. There was nobody else in the whole restaurant. Mm-hmm. Their party was it. And Robert Redford came in. And he comes over to my grandfather and he says, Senator Bennett, it's an honor to have you in our restaurant. You know, we don't always see eye to eye politically, but I honor you for your service to the country, anything you need, blah, blah, blah. Right? Mm-hmm. Very gracious, very kind, right? And he walks away. And my sister Peggy goes to Grandpa and goes, Grandpa, do you know who that was? And Grandpa says, no, but you know, when you're famous like me, people come up to you all the time. (laughs) Uh, That's funny. It was only Robert Redford. (laughs) Like the most Uh, famous actor ever. People come up to me all the time. Oh yeah, no problem. Just, you can leave the drinks in the back. We'll come get them. I think it's what he must have thought, like (laughs) restaurant manager or something. I I told this to Maddie. I said, I hope I don't ever meet Michael Jordan because I've idolized him for a long time, knowing that he's a jerk or at least hearing from other sources that he's a jerk. And it's not so much that I feel like he'd be a jerk to me if I met him, but it would (laughs) become very apparent that I don't matter to him. You know, like you, you know that it's obvious, but when you idolize someone they obviously don't idolize you. You know, he doesn't know who I am. And so that's such a weird thing to have such a one-way relationship become real. Because when you see him on TV, it's like, yeah, but you know, maybe we'd be friends if we met. But you meet someone like that and they're like, oh, hi, let me sign that. And like, they don't know you. And yeah. that's kind of weirdly hurtful. Like, it's not their fault, but I've met famous people before and I've had that reaction, like Kobe or something. Like, Kobe, Kobe. And he's just like, what's up? Hey. I talk to a million kids like you every day. You well, that's, so that's the Willie Wilson story. Do you remember the Willie Wilson story? So Willie Wilson went to Summit High School, graduated with Uncle D, and got drafted by the Kent City Royals right out of high school. Okay. Went to their minor league, eventually makes it to the major leagues, and he was playing left field for the Royals. And a bunch of us would go out when he played the Yankees, and we'd go sit in the left field bleachers. Mm-hmm. And he was super cool. He'd catch, like, he'd be shagging fly balls before the game, and Flipping balls up, you know, to, hey, we're from Summit Willie, and he'd flip us a ball. That's awesome. Super nice. And then he won the batting title and signed the big contract. And I didn't, this didn't happen to me, but it happened to a friend of mine. Went, they went to a game, out in left field before the game, they were like, hey, Willie, we're from Summit. And he turned and he flipped him off. Yikes. He got to that level of fame. He was like, I'm not from Summit anymore. I'm, I'm Willie Wilson. Yeah. I was like, Oh, kind of a cliche. Yeah. You know, like, remember where you're from. Yeah. Uh, I'm cool now and I don't need you. Yeah. It's too bad. Well, maybe not for him. <laughs> yeah. He's the batting. So when you are a super big star, remember that dad, brother, we're still. You mean bigger than the regional yes. champion. Bigger than when you're an even bigger star. Bigger star. Yeah. When, when you have your own when you podcast. Go to <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when you have with viewers. When you have your own podcast with over nine viewers an episode, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I guess seven now. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> that's good. Um, I heard an interesting 
angle on this one time. I was listening to Odell Beckham Jr. talk with LeBron on some talk show. And he was saying that, like, he's kind of become like a dancing monkey. You know, like... Odell Beckham or LeBron? Odell Beckham. Talking about himself. Gotcha. He said that because, you know, you're famous. He dances a lot. That's kind of his thing. He's well known for that. So now every time he goes to an arena, everyone's, Hey, Odell, dance! Dance for us! Dance! And, you know, every day, you know, it's their first interaction with him, but it's not his first interaction with fans. And so I, I bet day after day of people asking Michael Jordan to stick his tongue out or Jack Nicholson to say it one time, like filming him, just say, you can handle the truth just one time. You know, I wonder if like that just gets in their head and then that's when they start flipping people off and being too good. I saw Darius Rucker who's the lead singer of Hootie and the Blowfish. You ever heard of Hootie and the Blowfish? No. It's a, bit, a band in the 80s, early 90s. And his name is not Hootie. It's not That's Darius Rucker. That was okay. just the name of the band, Hootie and the Blowfish. I thought it was funny. It's uh -huh. an ironically stupid name, right? Uh -huh. And they, they were hits. They had a you know, good run. And uh, um, he says he gets so sick of playing their one big hit. Mm-hmm. Because everywhere we went, that's the song everybody knows. Yeah. He's like, you know, I have dozens of other songs. Yeah. That's the one they know. And so he has to play that song every time. Yeah. Isn't that what happened to uh, the girl from uh, that sings Somewhere Over the Rainbow? What's her name? Judy Garland. Judy, Judy Garland. Didn't she like commit suicide because of that? Because she peaked at her, 16 in her career and felt like she couldn't. Like, go, like, she was like, the rest of my life, people are going to ask me to sing that song and I have no more identity or something like that? Yeah, that was certainly part of it. I mean, she did have a, a, a very successful adult career, but they still tried to pull her back to that iconic role. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's hard. You know, the other thing that you mentioned, how about just below Daniel D. Lewis, you know, Hugh Jackman. Yeah. He's still a big star and a great actor. Um, I wonder what's... Can you have a trade-off and still be world-class at something? Can you have that? <laughs> Kindness trade-off. That will be good for the podcast. <laughs> yeah. My viewers love sneezes. Um, I've been around enough business people who think too much of themselves. I wonder if, the, if success breeds not just arrogance, but belittling. Hmm. To your point, you know, does having that much fame cause you to be arrogant and belittling, even though you don't really necessarily mean to be? I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that the arrogant and the belittling attitude led to the success. Which I think is completely wrong. So do I. Because all people who are great at anything had to win over someone. Yeah. I also think that it probably depends a lot on what you're great at like some people that are really great um they're not like that at all and i think it has to do with like the exposure that they have to people and their interaction with people like yo-yo ma you know probably the greatest what is he cellist i don't i would assume he's the greatest cellist because he's the only cellist i've ever heard of <laughs> um, but yo-yo ma is probably nicer or at least is in a position to end up nicer due to his fame than someone like Michael Jordan. Because Yo-Yo Ma is very famous, but he's not famous for getting in people's face. He's not famous for being competitive, for you know, stomping on someone's throat, signing autographs and being in front of an arena of screaming people. He's famous for being peaceful, being tranquil, you know, bringing softness and music to people. And that's probably why he's not a total jerk a total jerk yeah so let's start with this as a as a definition who's the most famous total jerk in the world michael jordan i was gonna say donald trump oh <laughs> donald trump <laughs> yeah well who's more famous michael jordan or donald trump uh, donald trump he's probably donald trump <laughs> jordan's pretty famous maybe four years ago yeah. that was closer but yeah um he is a jerk in order to get to be president of the united states you have to have such thick skin to get through all the oh yeah stuff that gets through you know that gets thrown at you and of course Donald Trump has been in the public eye for 
forever. So that wasn't new to him. Mm-hmm. But everybody else who runs for president. So Mitt Romney before him, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, mm-hmm. all those people who run for president, and now Joe Biden. Um, they have to look themselves in the mirror in the morning and say, I deserve to be the most powerful person on the planet. And that's got to mess with you. Yeah. If you think, yeah, I deserve that. And I'm better than you at being the most powerful person on the planet. I deserve to have the nuclear codes. And you don't. I deserve to choose which uh, deadly disease gets funding and which doesn't. Yes. Oh, wait. You know, stuff like that. Well, but that's the whole thing, right? You know, the, the, the realm of power breeds a certain amount of puff up in this. I don't know. It's not, not just pride or arrogance, but there's more to it than that. It's like I make myself bigger because I, I should be bigger because I'm all that. And how do those people, can you be humble and get to that point? I think that's probably, probably why people like Obama so much, because I guess in contrast, just personality, not, not politics wise, but in personality, the contrast between him and Trump, where he comes across as very confident and in charge, but in, uh, you know, I don't know, a more... A less in your face way, you know, a less like belittling, belligerent and aggressive way. But he still comes across as really confident, you know. Go back through the presidents and the candidates. Obama, Bush. Bush had kind of that, ah, shucks, good old boy. You know, he didn't come across as terribly arrogant. Mm Mm-hmm. Clinton before him, Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar. He had every reason to sort of look down his nose at people. Maybe he did. But he also comes across as sort of the, you're my buddy, we're, we're friends. Yeah. George Bush Sr. before that, apparently, according to all accounts, just super nice guy. So, mm. so, but, you know, maybe they weren't, we just don't know. Maybe politics, though, is its own thing because politics, you need to be liked. Mm. That's and that's fair. a big part is image, but like... A, Unless you're Donald Trump. That's your Donald Trump, yeah. Um, but like, for example, uh, an athlete again, or even better, the CEO of Apple. You know, if you're Steve Jobs, it doesn't benefit him politically to be liked in the same way that it does for Mitt Romney. And so he's thinking, I just need my product in this exact way, and the only way not to do it is to stomp on your head. That's the way he does it. But if you know, Barack Obama's stomping on people's heads. He probably doesn't become president because we don't see ourselves in him like you kind of want to see in a politician. That's a good point. So let's take business leaders then. We don't know very many, let's be honest. We really do. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates. Yeah. Not as many people in business get famous for some reason. Um, even the super wealthy, I mean, do we really know like the CEO of Walmart? The CEO of like Xerox yeah, or Staples. That guy's making millions. No one has any idea who he is. Yeah, and the, I did consulting years ago for Chevron. Uh-huh. And I was stunned to find out that Chevron was the fifth largest company in the world when I was consulting for them. And I'm like, I guess that makes sense. A really big oil company. Yeah. But I don't know anything about any of the people who run Chevron. Maybe they're jerks. Huh? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting to think about. I I wonder um, if it's strange that we hold specific people in our society to high regard and not other people, like actors, musicians, and athletes. Because, you know, why, why do we hold them in higher regard than other people in the society? Is it just because they're in our house? We see visible. them on our TVs? They're visible. They're visible, right? I mean, what, what else is visible? Entertainers, certain degree politicians, but not even all of them. But the CEO of Xerox? Yeah, because that's the weird thing, because you can't say necessarily that we just value the wealthy. At least, you know, if you compare the actors, musicians, they're not anywhere near as wealthy as big time, you know, real estate tycoons or 
business moguls. These guys are way richer, but so it's not wealth. That's uh, that's TikTokers. A... TikTok. oh, TikTokers. Yeah. TikTokers. Probably, yeah. I guess being visible, being attractive. Oh, Mark Zuckerberg's not particularly attractive. True. Actually, not particularly visible either. Jeff Bezos. But there's like like a big there's like ten big business people that we know that everyone knows because they're so famous. You know, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates. Um, well, who do we? Steve Jobs. Uh, Steve Jobs has been dead for right. What ten years more than that? But actors and actresses. I mean, there's hundreds, and they're rifling through fame constantly. And there's way more businesses than there are actors. I mean, how many actors make... How many actors are in 80% of the movies, do you think? It's probably not a big number. In the hundreds, but not in the tens of thousands. And how many CEOs are there? Well, I mean, even just on the Inc., 5,000, 5,000. Yeah. I mean... Makes sense. That's the top 5,000. There are... There got to be a million businesses in the U.S., maybe more. million businesses. And there's a thousand famous actors? What do you think? I don't know how many famous actors. <laughs> Especially with if fame now or like famous ever. It's a big, it's a big amount. Well, yeah, I guess that's true. And it's hard to quantify fame. I, I wonder if people who um, sell fame... You know, like uh, I was just watching the Muppet movie, and they are going. They want to be. They want to be on TV, so they go to this lady, and she has a chart of who the most famous people are, and the Muppets are like way on the outside. <laughs> like you're not famous enough to be on my TV show. I wonder with people who are really um, dialed in on who's famous and who's not. I wonder if they like have like exactly down like oh so and so's number one, Justin Bieber's number one, Selena Gomez is right here. You know, like what a great list that would. Like, oh, I'm number 42,637. million six hundred and thirty-seven. Man, if only I could crack the top forty million. Yeah. Well, I wonder what number I am of <laughs> famous people in the world. Well probably raised once you got a podcast. That's for sure true. <laughs> uh, podcast just shot me from like a hundred millionth to like nine hundred and ninety-ninth million. <laughs> but still I just jumped someone that you know. Um, I just jumped all of the people in Idaho. So that's for sure. So <laughs> shove them to the bottom. <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever see those ads they did with oh. me? What are you saying? Do you ever see those ads they did with me at Singular about um, spoofing the most interesting man in the world? Yeah. Here's Russ Fletcher, the 23rd most interesting man in the world. <laughs> I think that's so And then funny. David Bowie died. And so we did one where I said, no, I'm 22nd now. <laughs> Moving my way David up. David Bowie died. Can you imagine if there was like a, a ranking system? Um, if there was a ranking system of the most famous people in the world and they took in like, how many, how many likes do you get on average on your posts? How many people know your name? You know, that'd be. There are ranking systems for interesting things though. Yeah. So do you know who Scott Sheffield is? Mm, no. So Julie Fletcher, your cousin. Yeah. Bob's daughter is married to Scott Sheffield. Okay. And Scott's a very prominent, successful mathematician. Mm -hmm. And they rank them. There's a ranking of like the world's best mathematicians. Hmm. And I don't know where Scott is on the ranking. I don't know. He's high on the ranking, but I don't know where he is. But it's like difficulty of the equations you've solved, prominence of the papers you've written. Which conferences you've spoken at? I don't know all the. But there's actually there's like. Billboard top one hundred math people. I mean, that makes sense. I wonder if they're like if math is so quantifiable. But I wonder if we do top twenty five football teams. I wonder if there are rankings for lots of things. We just don't know it because we're not in. This. They have the top ranking like followers on Instagram. Okay, yeah. and that's easy. You know, that's a number. Um, uh, they have the top colleges. They come out with a a list every single year. It's actually a really interesting topic. Very controversial. 
the top colleges yes. because they for a long time they didn't require that they said what their uh, parameters were. But finally, they said, no, you have to tell us because it was changing so many huge things. Like, hey, you're ranked number one. Now, all of a sudden, you're getting like millions more um, because you were ranked number one. Anyway, when they finally came out with the metrics that they actually use to judge the top colleges, it's really controversial because one of them is alumni. How much does your alumni donate? Um, Which makes no difference to how good your education is. How good are your sports teams? Um, one of them was like something really strange. And the the one that people were saying, hey, why don't you have this was how well do your graduates do? Seems like an obvious one, but that, that wasn't on the list. You know, I remember years and years ago, one of the metrics was four year graduation rate. Mm-hmm. So do people get through in the normal four years and graduate? Mom would screw that. Well, and BYU got ranked really low because nobody graduates in four years from BYU. Right. They go on missions. Yeah, they go on missions. And so when they did the, when they, they published the, the criteria, mm-hmm. BYU said, can we use time in college as opposed to elapsed time? Mm-hmm. And they shot way up because lots of people graduate in four years in college, but it takes them six years to do it. Hmm. Heard an interesting stat. I heard that Provo is the number one uh, place in the nation for social mobility. Meaning um, you can change the easiest from low income earner to high income. So I, I, I heard it was Utah, Wasatch Front, not just Provo. Well, the reason, and again, I don't remember who I heard this from, so maybe it's not the most reliable source. But well, the, it was on the internet, it must be true. Yeah, it was on AskJeeves.com. Abraham Lincoln said it actually. <laughs> um, and it said that it was kind of faulty math. Not that it wasn't true, but that the reason that it came out that way was because that is such a concentrated place for people to be young and married and freshly graduated. Because then your income goes from, I'm in the negative, I'm in college. Not only do I not make money, but I'm $20,000 in debt. To I am now married, I have two income sources, and I now have a job. And most people, I guess, according... The jump is very the fast. The jump is very fast, even though it's actually pretty misleading. It's not like if you move to Provo, it'll be easier for you at all. It's just the people who happen to be in Provo stayed there through big money changes that skews the statistics. What lists do we wish they had? Sexiest people in the world? They have like sexiest man alive. And John Legend won that. You see that? John Legend? Really? You, yeah. Sexiest man alive. Now that you have a podcast, maybe that also. That's true. I bet I'm pro I bet sexiest people in the world. I bet I'm in the top million. Nah, that's pretty aggressive. <laughs> no, I bet I'm in the top billion. There's what, seven billion people? Almost eight. Okay, two billion. I bet I'm in the top <laughs> the two top, billion. The top quarter I, of the world. I bet well, okay, I could be men. In the- so you got you already cut off half the 50%. population. So now we're working with three above, and a half above the median. <laughs> so and the top three and a half billion men. I bet I'm in the top fifty percent sexiest men. I would say the same for myself, actually. And especially if you compare that to your age bracket. No, wait, no. If you don't compare that to your age <laughs> bracket, then I'm going against babies as well as super super old guys. Yeah, I'm easily top. 57%. <laughs> 55. I'm losing confidence quickly. <laughs> um, what, what what list do I wish there were? That's a good question. What if you could get graded on things? Like, oh, report card. Parenting report cards are due. Oh, crap. Can you imagine? Incomplete again. Best parents <laughs> in the county and they had a ranking. Oh. For be- oh man, that would get vicious. Well, yeah. Who's scoring you? It's just <laughs> Alexa. <computer>. Alexa. <laughs> Siri. Siri is listening in. Um You shouldn't have searched for that podcast. That would that could get yeah, that would get nasty. Because it's like you haven't played Beethoven for your sleeping kids in a while. Minus five Minus demerits. Five. <laughs> Black I wonder Mark. who the number one Harry Potter fan in the world is. 
Jamie Benn. Oh, Jamie. Yeah, that's we right. We already know that one. Sure, sure. But it would be so interesting to know, like, I am the best parent in the world. I wonder if there's something... What if you could say I'm the best um, teenager in the world? That is not true. Or the county. Like, <laughs> think about who... How about just in this house? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the top three. Um, think about who is the... Um, like, there's someone in the world that likes cheese more than anyone else in the world. Imagine if that was you. He, that person has no idea. Well, maybe they do. Actually, they probably, they probably know. know they like cheese <laughs> well, lot. I bet they know they're in the top, but I bet there's there's doubt there. Yeah. There could, there could be somebody who likes cheese more. There's, and then they just focus and they say, I have to have this prosciutto. That's not even cheese. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm... Well, it's so not you. Yeah, you just love it. Or like there's someone in the world who owned the most Bionicles <laughs> in the world. It's you. It's probably... You're probably up. I... I no joke. I bet you're in the top 0.5% of Bionicle ownership in the entire world. Because statistically, it's really... It sounds amazing, but you're actually like, wait... Yeah. How many people in the world own a Bionicle? What percentage of the world owns one Bionicle? So if we're talking about percentage of the world, he's world. in the top fraction of a million millionth of a percent. But if you start with 100% is everybody owns a Bionicle. Oh, okay. I didn't say that. No, and then I bet you're in the top 10% of I'll bet. anyone who owns a Bionicle. I think I'm, I'm in the top half of people, how well they tie their shoes. Oh, no, I suck at tying my shoes. You know what? This is hard to admit. I bet I'm in the bottom half of Parker's. I would. I'm also in the bottom half of Parker's. Oh, top ten percent. I'm a great Parker. <laughs> I, well, okay. And if you if you count all people, then there's a lot of people who can't drive. So if anyone ever asks me, I'm. I'm like, <laughs> like, yeah, start with people who can drive a car. Then within that. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder what I'm in the top 1% of. I Okay, I'm in the top 1% of Michael Jordan fans. I'm sure of that. Now, in all seriousness, though, if you actually take look at the world at large, like, think about how many many people are, there are in India. Yeah. Billion people in India. Billion mm-hmm. people in China. How many people in India live below sort of abject poverty? Right. You start to think about how many people there are in the world and where we are while we don't think of ourselves as particularly rich mm-hmm. comparatively. Especially from a global perspective. Yeah. We're the it's top 1% in the half, world. Half a percent. I mean, it's got to be... How many people in Brazil don't own land? Right. Or don't rent land? How many people are homeless? I mean, how many people are homeless in the world? You start with... Do you own anything? Okay, you just jumped. Right, half the population of the world. Do you own anything at all besides the clothes you're wearing? Yes. Okay, you just jumped this huge percent of the population. Do you own property? Yes, you just jumped. Do you have a job? It's amazing to think what you're in the... Just how... I mean, how well off you are from a global perspective. Now that's hard because you don't... It's a, basically impossible to think in a global perspective. Right, you live in this neighborhood. This is a very nice neighborhood. Other people are in the same sort of station in life. You don't think of yourself as saying, and compared to the underprivileged people in, you know, Calcutta, you don't, that doesn't... Well, what about like strength? Because like poverty doesn't denote poor strength. I mean, that's a good point. In the world, how strong are you? Well, bottom half. I'm, <laughs> I'm probably bottom half. So again, let's say, like, there's probably a lot more to that question. It's a good question. How many people are disabled? Okay, huge amount of the population. You're stronger than them. How many people are children? Okay, you just jumped in front of all them. So we're looking at the world. That's why statistics can be so misleading. Um, well, it's the old joke. If you're one in a million in China. So thousand people just like <laughs> it's like not that unique. Um, what I was going to say is even more so than thinking globally and having that kind of hit you like, oh, I am in the top 1% of something globally. If you think historically, Ooh. then it starts to be, hey, 
you know, like I, I live a terrible life. I'm in poverty, you know, in the slums of some country as compared to that exact same place a hundred years ago, 500 years ago, a thousand years ago. Like at least you're not running from a saber tooth tiger. You know, at least you're not, well, I mean, still it's, it's not, it's not to cheapen the fact that people have it hard nowadays, but like, you know, you're not a hunter gatherer. But, but think how close we are to what we would consider fairly primitive times. So you're my children. I was born in 1965. Okay, my father, so one generation from me, two generations from you, was born in 1921. His father was born in 1884. That's my, I knew him. That's my grandfather. In the 1800s. 18, that's, I'm only, from my dad to my grandfather, two generations, 1884. And his father was born in 1840 something and fought in the Civil War. That's not that far from us, right? It's, you know, you start to put it in relative terms. Now, I'm the youngest. My father's very old, so we have some. There's some cheating going on there. Not everybody jumps that fast. But still, four generations were into the 1840s. I mean... I mean, a couple generations, Declaration of Independence. Yeah. And, you know, we're wondering why we haven't figured everything out. (laughs) We're young. You know, I mean, how long have... um, How old are those cathedrals in Europe? So I went to the town of Ghent in Belgium Mm -hmm. and I was just staying at the Marriott, which is right on the river. And I had a couple of hours to kill. And I said to the guy at the, at the concierge desk, Hey, I've got some time to go. What should I do? And he said, go visit the cathedrals. I said, plural cathedrals. And he said, yeah, just walk up the hill and you'll see which one I should I see first. He said, just trust me, just start at the bottom, just walk up the hill, see the cathedrals. So go to the first one, and it, and it was built in like 900. And I'm just standing there going, this is a thousand-year-old building. And then I go up, the, the next one was, you know, the newer one was built in, you know, 1320. Before Columbus. And then the really new one, the, the beautiful one on the top of the hill, you know, was built in 1690. And that's still, you know, 300 yeah. plus years ago. 1690. It's... Let you know, alone like the pyramids. Well, yeah. And it's funny to think, do you think that people have, as people, independent of the cumulative knowledge of a society, an individual, do you think we've gotten better, smarter? Like, you compare me to a hunter-gatherer from, you know, thousands of years ago? Smarter in what sense? So... Like, biologically, or like we know yeah, like things? Yeah, like, you probably don't have as refined natural instincts as that hunter-gatherer. That's probably true. You probably could understand movements of animals, track things better than you can understand seasons. He probably also died very miserably in his 30s. True. Um... But you also understand all kinds of things that he would find magic. Well, okay. So let's say we take a baby from now and a baby from then and compare them and watch them grow up. Is there any difference? Is it just the time period that you're in or have people evolved? That's a really provocative question. The answer, I think, is both. You think people have evolved? I think people have evolved, but I also think so. So um, if Jesse Owens won the Olympic uh, 200 meter sprint in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. Mm -hmm. His time, if he ran side by side with Usain Bolt, he'd finish 14 feet behind him at the finish line. But they actually did a study of how fast his muscles were moving, analyzing footage of like how, how much he was moving. And they said if he ran... With the shoes that Usain Bolt uses on a modern track instead of uh, uh, 
ash. They used to make the tracks out of ash, and they they had actual spikes that they dug into the ash to run with. If Jesse Owen had uh, Usain Bolt's technology, he'd finish less than a half a second behind. Wow. So all of the advances are not that we're getting so much faster. It's that all the equipment and all the tracks and all the, you know, that's all making us physically move faster, but our bodies are actually about the same. Hmm. Have you ever wondered if we're doing the exact opposite of natural selection? like Natural deselection? Yeah, because like, or unnatural selection, where we are, you know, over generations thousands of years the strongest people survived and so and there were multiple there are many different types of people like there's different species of humans way back in the day like there was an entire group of short humans i don't remember what they're called homo erectus or something like that and eventually they devolved if that's the right word to people we have now like the the most successful people survived and the least successful didn't survive. But now we've got, you know, advances in technology. We're compassionate for the most part. Like we don't kill our old. We don't kill our uh, infirm. And which personally I am pro not killing people. Um, but it does make you think, does that mean that we're switching natural selection? Because back in the day, those genes would have died out. But now they pass on. What a provocative question. That's a great question. Something to think about. Have you ever read Guns, Germs, and Steel? I looked at it and realized it was the size of a brick. (laughs) I figured it would take me two years to read it, so no, I haven't read it. It's heavy lifting, right? It's it's not one of these light reads that you just sort of, you know, pop in your audible. Mm -hmm. um, But it starts out with the question, why did the Europeans sail across the ocean and conquer the Incas? Why didn't the Incas sail across the ocean and conquer the Europeans? If, if, if they all started from the Fertile Crescent and eventually over time ended up in these various parts of the world, mm-hmm. what made that society dif- so much more advanced that it could conquer this society? Mm-hmm. And it tries to go through and answer the question. It's the same kind of question. How did, how did that happen? Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever, did you see Robin Packard's post about the quarantine? Which one? Where she said, um, lots of women looking over at their man going, can he kill something? Can he build a fire? <laughs> and all lots of men now are rethinking them skinny jeans. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny and actually a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a moment there, you know, like kind of when the panic hit and like, where's no toilet paper, there's no food, there's no water. And you do kind of think to yourself, the day of the earthquake wow, what if I have to go find food in the wilderness? Like, what does my podcasting knowledge help when it comes to surviving? Well, I did stay at a Holiday Holiday Inn Express last night, so I'm going to be fine. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting to think of. One thing I would say um, to answer your question about why that society uh, conquered this one and not vice versa the, I was reading about this and like the fastest growing societies are the ones that learn to uh, multiply commerce the fastest and particularly the ones that invented credit. Interesting. Um, I was reading about a book that Robert recommended to me called Sapiens. He talks about how uh, two economies, one of them is a strictly trade economy. I trade you some beans and you give me some shoes, right? So in order for that to work, you need to have an exact amount of beans for the amount of shoes and they have to want that and all that, right? And so there's everything is based on the quantity of value that each person has. Compare that to a society that is based on credit. Now all of a sudden, you give $1,000, you put it in the bank, and then they can lend out that $1,000 to tons of people. And it's actually worth a multiple of 10. You know, that's now become $10,000 of value out. People are lending on $1,000. They just bought a house, not a thousand, but you know, you know what I'm saying? All of a sudden it's like you're multiplying money because everyone believes 
in credit, even if there's nothing actually backing it. And so your economy can grow 10 times faster because people are buying things with money they don't have. People are exchanging things instead of just, I only have 10 beans. This is how far the economy can go. It's, I'll have 10 beans in, you know, a year. I'll buy all this stuff right now. You know, and so something I'd never really thought of. Credit has kind of transformed the way that societies grow. Hmm. Thank you, Knights Templar. <laughs> I just read that book. I've been dying for someone to ask me. <laughs> Can't wait till we talk about credit. Finally say my <laughs> I've been waiting for this my whole life. That's made the podcast what it is today. <laughs> that comment about credit. Um, I've been thinking since you asked about the best, the rankings. I wonder... I wonder if I'm the best in the world at something that I've not. I wonder if I'm the best finger cracker. No, like, no. Grant, you crack your fingers a lot? I do, but I think you're better at it than me. So we could be number one and number two. I'm, oh. I, uh, I may be up there when it comes to the wind sound. <laughs> You want to keep going? I, how much longer do you guys want to go? Well, that's already like 40 minutes, right? That's, yeah, 40 minutes. We can just close it out. I'm just thinking, so who's going to watch a 60-minute podcast? Most podcasts are two, three hours, actually. Really? Yeah, podcast is a very, very unique uh, medium. We should have a podcast marathon. Like where we're hosting it? Yeah. I actually love that idea. And well, we should do it in shifts so you can like take a nap and go to the bathroom. Yeah. Unironically, I think that's an awesome idea and people have done that and it's actually been really awesome. Like, so Joe Rogan has the number one podcast. When people think podcast, they think Joe Rogan, right? That's what I think of. Right? It used to be Joe Rogan Fear Factor, now it's Joe Rogan Podcast. Um, and his podcasts are three hours, every single one. I'm not saying we should go for three hours. I'm I'm good for you know four or five hours. So. <laughs> well, I was falling asleep during the first one, so <laughs> I hit my first lump. But yeah, it, it's a very different, very different medium than than anything else. I'm slowly sliding a little lower and lower as the <laughs> nothing wrong with that <laughs> as the podcast goes on. I think it's yeah, it's not like a, people listen to them while they drive. Here's the thing that I think is fascinating about our family in particular. Mm-hmm. If you put a microphone in our kitchen, say a random Sunday night, mm-hmm. you get four or five hours of content that's interesting. Now you know why I wanted to do a podcast. Because we talk about, we meander through the world of uh-huh. the topics. It's fascinating. I used to sit there and listen to these super interesting conversations and think, wow, I wish I could hear this again. And so I started a podcast. That's exactly why. Um, I don't know exactly why our family is like that, but it's one of my favorite things in the whole world. So our family certainly was. The one I grew up in was the same way. Yeah. That's family gathering. Mm -hmm. You had a family gathering and, you know, two hours of meandering conversation. And it's like, okay, we're going home now. Yeah. See you next week. Uh Uh-huh. I don't know. I really appreciate that. I think that's fun. Um, other families have different things. You know, Maddie, her family plays games. We play games occasionally, but our fun is just talking. talking. Yeah. It's also how I think I've learned. By, talk, well, by talking. By talking. I verbalize my thoughts and that makes them more clear because once I say it out loud, like, oh, wait, that doesn't make sense. That's stupid. You know? It's, it's just fascinating to hear the breadth of things that we know. We're, we're very broad and very shallow mm-hmm. and occasionally deep. Mm-hmm. So what we'll do is we'll be bouncing around topics, and then we'll hit one that a lot of people have deep knowledge, movies. Yeah. And all of a sudden we'll have a four-hour conversation about the Marvel Universe. Yeah. Or the travesty of the Harry Potter movie. One of my first podcasts I ever did um, was with Brad, and he went off. You were there, Grant, about the Pixar 
Uh, the Pixar theory. Pixar theory. The theory of everything. The unifying theory of Pixar. Yeah, unfortunately, that was before I figured out how to get my, my microphone to work, so I didn't get any of it. But it was interesting <laughs> to listen to. But they're yeah. all like... Even the, the new ones? Have they tied the new ones in too? They're, they're people who are very devoted to the Pixar theory. Right? <laughs> YouTube, YouTubers. Where do you fall um, in that line? The My devotion to the Pixar theory. Have you sworn your allegiance? I've lost hope. <laughs> but there's some people who like, every time there's a Pixar movie, they're like, so how does this fit into the Pixar theory? Um, the, the brothers on YouTube, they're like the Elvin Carl Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> they they do that a lot, but I've found that it was a good theory that now is kind of disproven. Yeah. The more movies that come out. Well, yeah, because like how does Onward fit in the Pixar theory? Yeah. I mean, I don't really know the Pixar theory. All I know is that there's a theory that they're all Here's where it comes from. Okay. In the movie Brave. Remember the movie Brave? Mm -hmm. Is that the one that's like, if you could change your fate, would you would do you? it? Yeah. Um, Great movie. But do it. <laughs> In the scene with the witch, uh -huh. where she grants Merida her wish, on the table, she has figurines of Sully and Mike Wazowski from Monsters, Inc. And okay. Buzz Lightyear. Mm -hmm. and they're like they're carved into they're it. carved oh, so okay. how did she the witch okay get into the universe of these other movies now the reality is it's an easter egg that some of the some of the animators just stuck in there right but that's where the theory starts huh that universe must be somehow connected to all those other universes and the stories themselves intertwine is what you're saying right um I know that there are Easter eggs like that, like the ball with the star on it from Toy Story, I think is in a bunch of movies. Like it's in Boo's Room. In well, like Monsters the Pizza Planet Inc. trucks in everyone. All kinds of movies. In Onward, there is something. Uh, what is it? Is it the pizza place? It's like the restaurant that they go at is the same restaurant from somewhere else. Well, in Rapunzel and Flynn Rider, well, the another, coronation of Elsa in Frozen. Another really Do big one. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, is like the company that creates Buzz and all the toys is the same company from Wally, -E, and it's the same company and a bunch of stuff. Yeah, uh, I think Disney does that too, like Acme Incorporated or something. You know, they like have it on all their stuff. ACME. Well, Acme is Roadrunner. Right. Yeah. Just means it's the made-up company from Roadrunner, but Disney does it too. I don't think it's Acme, but they do this. There, yeah, there's some like in uh, Acme is in like uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? I think it's who the guys who make the dip that they fall in that kills tunes. So because the Pixar animators like to put the Easter eggs in, the Easter eggs tie all the movies together, and that's uh, where the theory comes. The theory of everything comes from. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. But there's like, there's some movies like um, Onward that aren't individual stories. They're new universes. You know? Bugs it's, Life. Well, a Bugs Life could just be like the world. You just watched that the other day, Bugs Life. But I mean like, Onward talks about how all this rich lore of the past and the modern. So if it was the same universe... Where was that rich lore before? Well, then you have to get creative. Like, Onward is a little tiny universe in the snow globe that sits on Andy's desk. I don't know. You <laughs> that, know that, like, kind of thing. that kind well, of stuff. They do yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. With, like, how after that humans leave Earth, or like they come back and they die out and they start turning to mon No, they leave Earth, the Cars universe happens, right? Because it's the growth of magic of the wisps from, from Brave. Brave. Ah, Brave. okay. That slowly infect everything and make them sentient. Um, but. I love um, how you said that. That slowly affect everything and make them, you know, as it happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. As it is. Um, but after the Cars universe, it like totally gets destroyed and crap. And then the humans come back 
slowly morphing into monsters. Why do the humans morph into monsters? Because of the will of the wisps. Ah, uh, the elder wand. Yes. I get it now. And then there's one one ring that rules them all. The crutch of the theory is that wood is magic, right? And the the wooden doors from Monsters Inc. don't take them to a new dimension. They take them back in time, right? So you're telling me that Boo was in a different time. Yeah. And so, and the reason why that works is. According to Brave, you asked. <laughs> in, in, no, I'm not that. <laughs> in Brave, like a large part of the witch's magic all has to do with wood. Right. Onward, magic comes from their staff. True. That could Harry be. Potter, magic comes from a wand. Yeah. Uh, in Bugs Life, the stick bug. Is the fiercest bug. Yes. And in Castaway... Oh, wait, that's not what I just <laughs> So I... That construction, that's so creative how they're able to tie all those things together. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the, the root of conspiracy theory. What do you mean? Yes. Hmm? It was yes, but with like a chess. Oh. <laughs> Where you take seemingly disparate pieces of data Mm -hmm. and find really tenuous connections and pretend that they're not tenuous at all. Mm -hmm. And so you can say, oh, let me weave all this together. Um, Years ago, uh, I I used to just like to walk through the library, just walk, you know, like random aisles, just like look at bookshelves and go, that one looks interesting and read it. Just... So I read a book called Best Evidence, which was on a theory on the JFK assassination. And if that's the only book you read, it seems very plausible. But if you read anything else, you realize he's taken like, and of course Wood is in this movie and it's in this movie. Therefore, they must be the same. Yeah. And and that's how conspiracy theories happen. Yeah. Um, I think it's even worse now because now that can be heightened because um, YouTube and you can put anything to like a dramatic music and like, did you know that George Bush actually visited Cuba the day before? And you're like, oh, I didn't even think of that. And the music sounds official and it's, you know, good lighting. Put music into this podcast. Yeah, especially right now. Can you, get some, can you get some reaction shots where we go? Say what? Or just like, he didn't do that. Jeepers, in, mister. <laughs> yeah. And that stuff makes a big deal, a uh, big difference. Like, I honestly think, like, okay, so I watched the, back to Michael Jordan, I watched a montage one time <laughs> of Michael Jordan missing shots. I don't know why they have that montage. But you watch it and you're like, man, this guy sucks. He was only like two feet away from the basket. How did he miss that? But... You can be so deceived by a video. It's insane. How many flat earthers are there? Who was the one? Was it uh, Kyrie Irving? Yes. Oh my gosh. Who's a flat earther? Kyrie Irving. No wonder they didn't sign him recently. <laughs> yeah. You can be fooled very easily now. And, and there's so much information that you don't even have time to consume it. You can be fooled just by a fake news headline. Well, like... One of the biggest problems is that instead of searching for, like, the most plausible, like, what is the point of science is that not that, like, any theory is correct, but is the most correct we have, mm-hmm. right? And so, but so often people do, like, the most fun idea, the most, like, interesting idea, instead of with all, with all the facts. What makes the most sense? Well, or the one that I I can construct from my knowledge. I may only have a fraction of the knowledge of a subject, but all that I know is this, so I can construct everything based on what I know. And since I know this really well, and you know this over here, I can convince you that my theory makes sense because you don't know what I know, and I don't know what you know. And that happens all the time. There's a... um, 
disproportionate level of passion when it comes to the truth. Because how many people are passionate that the earth is round? Almost no one. Nobody. Because the, everyone just believes it. How many people are passionate that it's flat? The people that are in that small sliver of crazy science, conspiracy theories, insane ideas, they're very passionate about those insane ideas. So it's kind of unfair because no one is standing up yelling, no, the earth is round because no one cares. But the people who think that they found the nugget, they think that they've disrupted the status quo, even though it's ridiculous, they're very passionate about it. So that's why those things get blown out of proportion. So much of what we should do as humans is based on probability, mm -hmm. likelihood, statistics. Mm -hmm. um, and but people don't. That's not fun. Um, and it's it's the the concept of Occam's razor. Have you heard the concept of Occam's razor? No. Um, Occam's razor is a principle that says um, the most plausible, the simplest. The easiest explanation is overwhelmingly the most likely to be true. Mm -hmm. So try to reduce all of the craziness down to the most simple, the most rational, the most plausible explanation. And almost all the time, you'll be right. Hmm. Um, and and it, it's, a, it's a basic principle of all kinds of rational thinking. But the same principle applies, which is that says, if you continue to eliminate things... Whatever's left, however improbable, is still right. If you, if you eliminate, well, I'll give you an example. Go to the doctor. You're sick. Mm -hmm. Go to the doctor. He takes your temperature and he says, you know, you have a cold. Take, you know, Tamiflu, not Tamiflu, take a Tylenol PM, get some rest, and you'll be well. You take it and you don't get better. You go back, you say, look, I'm still sick. I got a fever. I got, and I've got this rash. And he goes, oh, you didn't tell me about the rash. Well, you probably have. And now he's taking statistically, what's the most likely thing that you have that has a fever and a rash? Mm -hmm. and he's going to treat that. And if you get better, then that's what you had. Mm -hmm. If you don't get better, then he's going to go to the next most likely thing. And he's going to keep going down the next most likely thing until the, he might finally get to the thing you actually have, which is so super unlikely from the beginning. But if he jumps to that, he looks like he's crazy. Right. So what he's really done is not, he's not treated you medically, he's treated you statistically. And now we do that a lot. Hmm. That's interesting. I'd never thought of that. So you call the IT department. My computer isn't working. What do they tell you? Turn it on and off. Turn it on and off. Why? Because it's... The, the most likely thing that's going to happen is... Yeah. It'll reboot the system and that'll be fine and you'll be better off. And 60% of the time that solves the problem. So that's where they always start. Okay, I didn't do it. All right, what's the next most likely thing? I think that uh, people naturally, all people, I think it's a human trait, are very bad at understanding statistics including myself i think that's actually a human trait and i think it's intentional because again going back to you know prehistoric times statistics aren't necessarily a survival technique you know you don't need to know the difference between a million and a billion because your mind doesn't need to wrap around that kind of knowledge you need to know how do i protect myself from the saber-toothed tiger right? and and you ask people stuff like that you know, big numbers, statistics, how many, you know, how many seconds is a million seconds versus how many seconds is a billion seconds? And without calculating it, you have no idea. Like a million seconds, I don't know, a year, two years, how many is a billion, uh, uh, five years? And I don't even remember exactly what it is. It's something like a million is 13 days. And a billion is like so many years. I don't remember. But what I'm saying that's interesting is that we don't really have the ability to think about those things instinctively very well. We can calculate them, 
but I don't think human beings can really grasp large numbers. Just they're not just born with that. Well, we're not. We're not rational. What I described about the statistical approach to solving problems. That's a doctor that you're going to see or a scientist. But people don't behave that way as a general rule. Have you ever heard, the, have you ever heard the, the black dog on the street analogy? Mm -mm. Let's try it with you two. Okay. You walk, you're walking down the street. We'll start with you and then we'll do you. You're walking down the street. You turn the corner. You have to turn and go down that street. And at the end of the block, you can see a big black dog. What do you do? You personally. I would probably walk to a different street. Why? Because I'm scared of ducks. Right. Okay. Yeah. Walking down the street, turn the corner, got to go down the block, see at the end of the block a big black dog. What do you do? Probably the same. Probably like, is that the only path I can take? Or is no. it like. But it's the most direct path. It's where you're headed. And it's at night. No. You can see it. It's, a, it's afternoon. You can see it's a. A big black dog, you can't really make out features, but you can see it's pretty big, and it's on the street corner where you're headed. I'd probably act the same, of like, either be very cautious, or take a different path. I'm just kind of afraid of dogs. You're both kind of afraid of dogs. Yeah, that I mean... That sucks as an example. Let me... Let I, me might, I might walk closer to see what happens. I, I probably could just like walk on the other side of the street. Okay, so yeah, I'm afraid of dogs. So, but I, I think honestly in real life, I probably would go down and just like try not to make eye contact with the dog. So I've asked this question to a variety of different people. Uh -huh. I get an answer like some this one woman said, I love dogs. What kind of dog is it? And she's headed toward the dog. Uh-huh. I love stray dogs are one of my favorite things to to find. I, I, I I'm I'm like a dog whisperer. Can I pet the dog? Is it is it allowed? I mean, she's this, she's all in on the dog. Mm -hmm. One guy was so terrified of dogs. He said, "If I turn a corner and there's a dog, I immediately go back. I don't even care if I don't get to my appointment. I'm I'm never on the street with the dog." Mm -hmm. Some people say, "Well, I would walk cautiously down the street to see how the dog behaved." Yeah, that's probably what I would do. Me too, actually. Um, and then if I get close enough and it's looking menacing, I cross the street or. You know, people have varying things. Now, in all of those scenarios, the dog whisperer, the guy who's so terrified he would turn back and skip his appointment, the person who crosses the street, all those scenarios. Has the dog changed? Has the street changed? Have the circumstances at all changed? No. The only thing that's changed, because I haven't given you any information about the dog, is your perception. Yeah. That's how human beings behave. They yeah. bring with them... It's almost as if we have a different window through which we see the world. And, and that, more than reason and more than logic and more than data, is how most human beings make decisions. And that's what makes us so wonderful and, and complex to understand. Because the same dog, the same street, the same day, the same task, everything the same, 50 people will give you 50 different answers on how they respond to that situation. You'd, uh, you'd like the book, The Laws of Human Nature? Because there's a there's a long session section about how humans are all irrational. Yes. And a big part of the book is trying to break down the idea of that you are outside of humans. You're not. What it is is humans are irrational. Therefore, you, the reader, are an irrational person. Right. Which is very interesting. I I get I go on these binge reading things. I I, do, I binge read about a topic, and I started with a book called Predictably Irrational, and then I read a book called Bias, and then I read a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, and that's it's all about that about irrational behavior because same dog, same everything, but different people behave differently. There's real, and mm -hmm. if you're now designing how to help you. How do I design a product that's going to help all of those people right, walk right. down the street? It is interesting. I read a book. I read a book called Pitch Anything. Uh, Brad recommended it to me, and it is about the art of pitching an idea, specifically, you know, a business. And basically, the main idea of the book is exactly that: that people are irrational. 
and that there's two modes of thought, thinking fast and slow. There's the reptilian brain and there's the analytical brain. And the reptilian brain is your decisions. And it's the brain that you have. It's the brain that cavemen have. It's the brain that deer have. It's just the animal brain that says, ooh, that's hot, let me move. It's instinctive and it's quick. And the analytical brain takes a lot of energy. The analytical brain is, okay, so if I spend two ninety five with this car a month versus this car, and you only have so much energy to do the analytical side, and it's very taxing on your brain. And so in order to pitch something or to persuade someone, you need to tap into their reptilian brain as fast as possible, as fast as possible because people don't use their analytical brain unless they absolutely have to. The, the reptilian brain is what says on the telephone, I recognize this voice. Mm-hmm. Or I don't recognize this voice, but it's a nice person. Mm-hmm. They must be smiling on the other I end. I can tell that they're smiling. I think it's, I learned this a lot from doing sales too. I think it's kind of an arrogance that a lot of people have to think that they're above marketing, that they're above sales techniques, that they're, uh, you know, above like adding, adding music to the back of a, of a, picture of mashed potatoes isn't going to make me want to buy mashed potatoes but it is i fall for marketing so easily. yeah we all do and you don't even realize it. it like our whole life are these pillars of marketing and you know ad campaigns and things that we've seen that we accept to be reality that maybe aren't reality at all you know like that's uh, why there's something really fascinating and enticing by like the fight club mentality of like, oh wait, you don't have to care about that. You you do and you naturally do, but you don't necessarily have to. Which is why I think that movie's so good. Have you seen it? I have. Oh. I haven't seen it, but it is good. I like it a lot. He too. says you are not your job. Right? Yeah. But you're totally your job. Depends how you think about it. What's the first thing that's going to be in in that cracked article we like so much? Mm -hmm. He says that. He says, of course, you're totally your job. What's the first line of your, if you were to die, what would they say? Former NFL quarterback dies from, you know, in a car crash. The first line of everything is, what did you do with your life? Former podcast of seven. (laughs) Former podcaster with 12 viewers. (laughs) Only 10 tonight. 10. (laughs) You guys can watch it. We'll watch it later. <laughs> that was just this was really fun. Yeah, this was really fun. Thanks for coming, guys. We'll be on version seventy-two whenever the next whenever yes. episode. That's super fun. And I. Ibikae, melon farmers. <laughs> <laughs>